Good. Good morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? No? Good morning. How about there? All right. Good morning and welcome to Langhorn United Methodist Church. My name is Kim Smeagol and I will be your worship assistant this morning. Um, just a couple of announcements. The United Women in Faith will hold their next meeting on Tuesday, January 9th at 7 p.m. in Fellowship Hall, and this is open to all women. Um, they are also collecting socks for the needy. Um, if you would like to contribute those items, um, there's a Christmas tree that's still up in Fellowship Hall um, that will be there through January. Just place the socks there. Um, and now Pastor Walt has an announcement. Good morning. Good morning. Just want to thank uh, the entire congregation for your gift. Karen and I are uh, very grateful for that. Uh, we want you to know that it's a big joy uh, for us to serve among you uh, in ministry doing the Lord's work. And so we really appreciate your thoughtfulness. Thank you so much. Um, now our call to worship. It's not that important to prove that you're right after arguing loud and long. It's not that important to prove the other guy's wrong in order to prove your faith strong. The Lord that will end up winning the day, or the thing that will end up winning the day, are the volumes of good stuff that your love has to say. Drawing souls to Jesus is the only thing that it's really about. Please stand if you are able and join me in singing our first hymn, hymn number 438, Forth in Thy Name, O Lord. be seated and let us pray dear Lord God maybe this world has always been a difficult and challenging place to be but father to us it certainly seems like it is now so many people are angry about something so many people mistrust each other so many people are willing and maybe even eager to think the worst of each other it's not easy at all here in the world right now but Lord, you have called those who follow you to be a force for good. 
You've called us to be the salt of the earth, salt that pre preserves things and keeps them from being spoiled, and salt that gives things a desirable flavor. So our prayer this morning, Father, is that we can be people who bring peace, your peace. We pray that we can be people who draw other people to you and to each other. We pray that we can be the salt of the earth, making life taste good and preserving its quality. Right here and now, Lord, we silently lift before you the name of someone we know who needs to repent of their sin, receive your son Jesus into their heart. And we pray, Lord, that you'll give us the opportunity to share your truth with them. And now, Father, please hear the praises and prayer requests of your people. We remember, Father, that there are many among us today who are working their way through all sorts of trials. Some of us have illnesses and injuries that have come upon us recently, and others have been battling them for a long time. Some of us have emotional problems, and some have family problems. Some have problems at work, and some of us have no work, and some have problems with their marriage or with their kids or grandkids. These are all trials things that had the potential to derail us or frustrate us, immobilize us, neutralize us. But Lord, they don't have to. If we hang on and trust you, so Father, we pray for all these people that you help them to hang on to your hand and trust you. And Lord, we pray that you bring healing and relief and peace and resolution. We pray that you put together what has broken apart and that you restore what you know to be good. Father, give us more people from within our congregation who are willing to put on their red Pray For You t-shirt and participate with us walking for an hour in the Oxford Valley Mall. Help us to become faithful to you when it comes to sharing the truth that we know about you, Lord, wherever and whenever the opportunity comes up. Help us to make and have friends who are not believers and not church people, and help us to be a source of blessing and truth in their lives. And may they see you in us, Father. Lord, we know that it's not enough in your eyes that we simply live well in our community. No, Father, you also want your followers to represent the solution to the pain and suffering around us. So, Lord, use us as the instruments of your peace. Help us to make life better for the people around us. And so trusting that you care about every detail of our lives and every burden in our hearts, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now our tithes and offerings will be brought forward to the Lord God. If you're able, please rise.
Dear Lord God, if we really give thought to the number and the quality of blessings that you give us day after day, it'll boggle our minds. If we give thought to the amount of mercy that you show us day after day for the innumerable ways in which we let you down, that too will boggle our minds. Father, we receive so much that we really don't deserve, yet you keep on blessing us. Hear our thanks, Lord, and receive our praise. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, found on page 804 in your pew Bible and also printed on the back of your bulletin. Accept him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everybody. Been dealing this week with a little bit of head cold kind of stuff, so the voice might do some interesting things, but we'll get there. So we are in uh, the book of Romans, chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, on page 804 in your pew Bible. Uh, it's also printed on the back of your bulletin. And um, for the past two weeks there in chapter 13, we've heard the Apostle Paul really firing on all eight cylinders. He's been letting it rip. He's had a very big, important message for us, and he's been hammering it home. First of all, he's been telling us that we, you and I, are in a battle. And it's not an accident that we're in that battle. We've been put there by none other than the Lord God himself. And what's more, we're not just helpless victims in this battle. We're not spectators, you know, just watching it go on. Uh, at least we're not supposed to be. You know, it's God's intention that you and I are to be combatants. We are supposed to be helping to fight the battle. Now, of course, Satan knows all about that. Um, there's no surprise in any of that for Satan. And, and he knows that if, if God put Christians into this battle, then he knows that God has already given those Christians everything that they need in order to be successful in it. Which, if you're Satan, is not a very settling thought. And, and you know, these Christians already have everything that they need to win and to win big. Satan knows this. And, of course, that makes him feel desperate, as it well should. So what does Satan do? Satan does his best to mess up, to distract, to discourage, to neutralize, to paralyze whatever segments of God's army, in other words, Christians like you and me, he, he looks to do that, to mess us up in any way that he can. Satan will mess up groups of Christians if he can do it, and, and he'll mess up individual Christians if he can do it. And how does Satan attempt to mess us up? Well, Satan wants to trick us into fighting the wrong battle against the wrong enemy using the wrong weapons. Wrong, wrong, wrong. 
And, and if we fall for that, if we swallow the bait, then Satan will have succeeded in neutralizing us and making us useless and ineffective for God's kingdom right at the point where we need to be the most useful. And so we, we saw that before we even tried to understand what Satan was up to, we needed to get crystal clear in our minds what exactly the right battle is. We saw in the Bible the, the right battle, the battle that Jesus himself put us into, is the battle for people's souls. That's the battle. And, and when did Jesus put us into that battle? It's without a doubt when he gave us the Great Commission. You know, the Great Commission when Jesus said to you and me, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus said. Therefore, go, he's talking to you and me, go and make disciples of all nations, that means everybody, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. And we saw that the stakes in this battle are incredibly high. In a nutshell, all the people that you can see, anywhere and everywhere, they're all headed directly to hell until and unless they have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. No saving relationship with Jesus Christ, no heaven. That's what the Bible says. And, and so that includes people who you like, and it includes people who you don't like, and people who look like you, and people who don't look like you, and people who have the same amount of money as you, and people who have more money than you, and people who have less money than you, and, and people with more moral fiber than you do, and people with less moral fiber than you do, and, and, and people with big families, and people with no families, and people who want Trump or another Republican to win the election, or people who want Biden or another Democrat to win the election, people who are socialists, or people who are communists, and even people who are anarchists, and, and they're all, all, all people who have souls. And Jesus put you and me into the battle for their souls. Jesus wants their souls to be in relationship to him just like he wants your soul to be in relationship to him. Now, if you're wondering whose soul you don't have to try and win into a relationship with Jesus, who you don't have to try, the answer is nobody's. Nobody's. And that's whether you like them or not. And you and I have got to love them anyway, no matter who they are, in the name of Jesus. That's what you're doing here, like it or not. And, and that's because almost none of these people that you see around you will come into a relationship with Jesus if they don't see his love coming from you and from me. People have got to see his love coming from you and from me. Now, when, when Jesus looks at that on Judgment Day, guess who's going to bear some of the responsibility for that? Yeah, that's right. It'll be you and me. And it's Jesus who set it up that way, like it or not. So how does Satan go about trying to get us into the wrong battle? Well, he gets us thinking about, we, you know, maybe you should be making converts in the way of uh, politics. You, you know, or we got to make converts uh, to our own co code of morality. Or we, we got to make converts to our understanding of patriotism. Now, hear me, folks. Listen, listen, listen. 
Am I saying that politics or morality or even patriotism are bad things? Am I saying those are bad things? No, 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 I'm not saying that at all. They are good and important things. They're worthwhile things. They're very important. You should care about those things. But what I am saying is that you can have good and right politics and you can have good and right views on morality and you can have good and right views on patriotism and still end up spending eternity in hell. That's what I'm saying. And, and that would be because you, you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. you got to have that. It's a must-have. You and I, who belong to Jesus and follow Jesus, are the only people in this world who have the job given to us by God of trying to prevent any and all people from going to hell forever. We are the only ones. If you and I don't do it, no one's going to do that. But of course, this is a battle. And in any battle, you have to have an opponent. And so we have an opponent. So who is our opponent? Our opponent is Satan. Satan is our opponent. And who says so? Jesus says so. Please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 31. It's page 762 in your view Bible. Page 762, Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 31, page 762. And let's see what Jesus said there in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 31, page 762. Let's, look, let's listen to what Jesus said. He said, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And the Bible is very clear in several places that by that phrase, the prince of this world, Jesus is talking about Satan. But let me show you another place that the Bible tells us that our enemy is Satan. Please turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 3 and 4. And I don't have the page number there. If someone has the page number, yell it out. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Pardon me, louder. 818, page 818, thank you. Page 818, page 818, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, page 818. So listen to what the Apostle Paul is telling us there. It says in verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, that is to unbelievers. The God of this age, notice that's God with a small g, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So uh, God with a small g, Paul is referring to Satan here. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So does that mean <coughs> that the unbelievers are our enemy? No, it does not. Does that mean that we should fight them in order to prove them wrong and then defeat them? No. It means our primary goal should be trying to save them. Now, how do I know that? Is it just my opinion? No, the Bible tells me so. So please turn with me now <coughs> to Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It's page 835 in your pew Bible. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, page 835 in your pew Bible. And 
Let, let's, let's focus carefully on this. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, page 835. Here's what it says. It says, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Now, does Paul mean to be wise uh, and make the, the most of every opportunity so that you can yell at the outsiders and defeat them? Prove them wrong? Well, a good, good answer. L listen to verse 6. See what you think, those of you who still are in doubt. <coughs> verse 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace. And there's that grace word again. And what's grace mean? It means unmerited favor. Favor that you don't deserve. Let your conversation be full of grace. And going on. <coughs> <clears throat> seasoned with salt. And didn't Jesus tell us that, that we are to be salt? Salt makes things taste good, right? You know, so, so we are to be salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. What that know how to answer everyone about what? Know how to answer them about what? Well, Paul tells us in verse 3 of that same chapter of Colossians that he wants to proclaim the mystery of Christ to everyone. That's what we're to answer everyone about is the mystery of Christ. <coughs> Let me get a little water here, folks. We'll make it. So do you see that Paul is saying that every one of us who are um, believers are in a battle that Jesus put us in. And the battle is not about us winning. The battle is not about us winning. No, the battle is about Christ winning. Big difference big difference. And so what you want to happen and what I want to happen really don't matter too much and really don't take first place. What takes first place is what Christ wants to happen. And what Christ wants to happen is for unbelieving people to receive him and then to grow in their faith that's what he wants. That's what takes first place because nothing good is going to happen in our country or in this world until that happens. And that is what you and I are doing in this world in the first place. Okay. All of that now brings us to chapter 14, verse 1 of Romans. So let's please turn back there. It's page 804 in your pew Bible. And uh, chapter 14, verse 1, page 804, here's what it says. It says, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Now, Paul is going to get into a, a discussion here about people who are weak in faith as opposed to people who are strong in faith. And a lot of Christians get all wrapped around the axle about what makes you weak in faith and what makes you strong in faith. But I don't want us to do that because it misses the whole point of what Paul is trying to teach us here in chapter 14. I mean, it misses the whole point. So let's take a minute to get real clear on what it is that Paul wants us to learn in this chapter. Basically, Paul's going to follow through on what we just learned in chapter 13, and he's going to stick it like a doctor's hypodermic needle into the way that we treat each other as believers in Christ, the way that we treat each other. And so Paul wants us to know that the battle for souls, the battle for souls on the outside and the battle for the souls of your brothers and sisters in your church family is so important 
and Christ's desire <coughs> that his followers <coughs> grow in their faith is so important that it needs to become it needs to come before or in front of our desire to be right even when we actually are right even when we actually are right. And if that just blew your mind, wait, it gets worse. Yes, it does. In the second half of this chapter, Paul is going to instruct us that even if you are the strong one, you are the strong one. You know, the right one. You and I must be willing to act like we have been wrong if that's going to help our brother or sister in Christ to grow in their faith. Wow. Did you get that? You and I must be willing to act like we have been wrong if that's going to help our brother and sister in Christ to grow in our faith. In other words, we must put ourselves and our strength and our rightness second. And that's because helping a fellow Christian grow is more important to God than proving yourself strong or proving yourself right, winning the argument. That's big. And you want to keep that in mind, folks, because that's what's going to help you to really understand what's going on in this chapter. This is radical stuff. You'll see it in black and white for yourselves. And before we go plowing into chapter 14, I need to give you a little bit of background here as to what was going on in Rome at the point <coughs> that Paul wrote this letter to the Christians there. And you need that background so that you can understand some of these things that Paul is going to refer to. Otherwise, you're going to be reading words on the page, but you won't really be understanding what you're reading. So let's, let's take a minute and do that right now. All right, so, so we're not actually sure, uh, exactly sure, how Christianity arrived in Rome but scholars have really good reason to believe that it got introdu introduced to Rome in the Jewish synagogue there first. That is where Christianity took hold. And we know, what we know for sure is that it was not the Apostle Paul who introduced Christianity to Rome. Of course, there were Jews who were unbelievers in that synagogue, and there were also Jewish believers in Christ in that synagogue. And then there were Gentiles who had fully converted to Judaism. And then there were also the God-fearers. You remember the God-fearers? You remember in the book of Acts, um, we said the God-fearers were Gentiles who followed the Jewish law and customs, but they hadn't fully converted to Judaism yet. So there was quite a mix of people there in the synagogue of Rome. And hopefully you'll remember from the book of Acts that when uh, Paul would preach Christ there, very often it would have an explosive effect. Some people would get really, really mad at Paul. And there were several instances where riots broke out and Paul got thrown in jail and there were people who very much wanted to kill him. Well, anyway, that's, that's what happened at Rome <coughs> in the synagogue there several years before Paul wrote the epistle to the Romans. In, in the year 49 AD, there were violent riots in Rome and in, in that Roman synagogue, and it was all over this new faith in Jesus. And the Roman emperor, who was a man named Claudius, wanted no parts of that. So he issued a command that all Jews were to be evicted. They were to be booted out 
of Rome. Get them out of here. And you don't have to turn to it, but we read about that in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. It, what it said there, I'll read it to you. <coughs> there, Paul met, met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So they had been ordered out. So when that happened, the synagogue at Rome didn't just close up, even though the Jews left. No, there were still all these Gentiles who had converted and all the God-fearers there. So it stayed open. They kept coming together there. And, and, and after all, Claudius, uh, the emperor, didn't boot them out because they were Gentiles. And actually, while the Jews were gone, the number of Gentiles in the Roman synagogue grew. There were more of them. Actually, this guy uh, Claudius, Emperor Claudius, must have had a slightly unhappy marriage um, because his wife Agrippina and Agrippina's son Nero, um, they had him killed, and, um, which is typically a sign of an unhappy marriage. And, and um, they had him assassinated in the year 54 AD. And so with Claudius dead, the Jews who had been booted out of Rome now started to make their way back. They're coming back to Rome. But while the Jews had been gone, the Gentiles now had become the majority in the synagogue of Rome. If you can imagine that, a synagogue where the majority of people are Gentile. And, and so they're the majority in, in the, the synagogue and they're the majority in the community there. So when the Jews returned to Rome after five years had passed, they probably couldn't live in their old neighborhood anymore because there were new occupants. They were Gentiles. And, and, and so they, they probably couldn't easily get kosher meat like they could before, seriously, because there, were, there wasn't anyone there who ate kosher meat. And, and they came back now to a Roman synagogue dominated by Gentiles. Who, who didn't observe the kosher laws and didn't observe the Saturday Sabbath and, and didn't observe the Jewish calendar of sacred days. So it's important for us to understand that Paul is talking to a church at Rome that was once a majority of Jewish believers in Christ with just a few Gentiles mixed in, but now was a minority of Jewish believers with a majority of Gentile believers. And that was a hard adjustment for everyone to make because a lot of the Jewish believers still felt the need to only eat kosher meat. And if they couldn't do that, they felt that they could only please God by avoiding all meat and just sticking with eating vegetables. The Gentile believers didn't feel any need whatsoever to eat kosher meat, and they just felt that their relationship with Christ was fine. You know, the meat's not a problem. And the Jewish believers still felt like in order to be pleasing to God, they needed to honor all their Jewish um, sacred days on their calendar, and the Gentile believers, what are you talking about? You know, I don't feel any need to do that. They felt as though God wasn't requiring that of them. And so very likely, this is where it's all coming together here, very likely when Paul is talking about weak believers and strong believers, he's probably identifying the Gentiles who didn't want to follow the Jewish customs as the strong believers because their faith didn't require these Old Testament laws to prop it up. And Paul's probably identifying the Jewish believers and the small number of Gentile believers who felt the need to continue the Jewish customs as the weak believers. So now we know who's who. All right, so having said all that, now let's read verses 1 through 4 
in chapter 14, now that we know all that. Accept him, it says, verse 1, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. So Paul's saying that Gentile, the Gentile believers there at Rome should welcome these Jewish believers back who are now returning. But right off the bat, Paul is teaching that being right or wrong here is not the point. Being right or wrong is not the point. Going on, verse 2. One man's faith allows him to eat everything. So that's the Gentile believers. But another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. That's the Jewish believer who can't find anywhere to buy kosher meat. Verse 3. The man who eats everything, the Gentile believer, must not look down on him who does not, the Jewish believer. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Verse 4. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? In other words, someone else's servant is the person who is serving God. That's who the someone else is. The person is serving God. Going on. To his own master, meaning to God, he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, let's, let's be real clear on the fact that Paul is not talking about differences of opinion on the central pillars that are holding up our faith. He, he's not talking about a difference of opinion about whether Jesus is God or not. That's not what he's talking about. Of course, Paul would say that all Christians, in order to be Christian, have to agree that Jesus is God. That's not the kind of differences that he's talking about. No, Paul is talking here about things that are smaller than that in importance, like when the Sabbath is, and, and what kind of meat you can eat, and things like that. And so the point that we're seeing Paul make here so far is that among Christian believers in these smaller matters being right or being strong is not the point not the point and he's saying that if you've been thinking it's the point you're missing the point big thing to remember from what we've heard Paul say so far in this chapter is that it is way more important for believers to be loving than it is for believers uh, to be right or strong in matters like this. The love is more important than being right or strong. So what are you supposed to do with this? <coughs> what's it supposed to look like in your life? In other words, so what? yeah, so what? Well, I'll tell you after I take a drink. Actually, to answer that, let me give you an example from my own life, okay? Now, when I give you this example, please understand that I am not claiming that you should do exactly the same thing that I did. I'm not saying that. I'm just giving you this, this example to show you how the principle that Paul is teaching us here, how that principle works, okay? So, okay. So, many years ago, when I was a much younger man, one of my favorite things on a really hot summer day especially if I was at a picnic or something like that, would be to have a nice hot dog all loaded up with the fixins, you know, onions and sauerkraut and peppers and mustard and, you know, yeah. And, and, and then, that's in this hand, and then in this hand, I really like to have an ice-cold St. Pauli girl beer. Hot dog, 
beer, hot summer day, yeah. How wonderful that was. How great. And I wasn't, I wasn't trying to get drunk at all. I just loved the taste of that hot dog, and I loved the coldness and the taste of that St. Pauli girl beer. Now, I wasn't even a believer then, but even if I were, would it have been a sin for me to have that beer with the hot dog? You know, especially since I wasn't trying to get drunk, because getting drunk or high is in fact a sin, but would that have been a sin, you know, hot dog and a beer at a picnic? No, no, it would not be a sin, not at all. And it wouldn't have been a sin for you uh, to have a beer like that either. I know that. After all, Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding in Cana. And Paul told Timothy to drink wine for his digestion. I get all that. I, I know that. But early on in my relationship with Christ, I decided that there were unbelievers out there, and maybe even some believers too, who expected that a Christian um, shouldn't drink alcohol at all. There are plenty of people who think that, and, and and they think that if they do, then the Christian is sinning. And even though their view is not really supported by the Bible, I decided that my witness to Christ to them was more important than my proving myself right so that I could have my beer with my hot dog. So the way that plays out is that over the past 40 plus years, I've had a grand total of maybe three or four glasses of beer in that whole time. And maybe a grand total, if you were to total it all up, of one full glass of wine. And again, drinking beer or drinking wine, you know, and not intending to get drunk or trying to get drunk, it's not a sin. I'm not saying that. You know, for me, being right, which I would have been having a beer with my hot dog, wasn't as important as my witness to Christ to unbelievers. And maybe it's not beer and hot dogs for you. Maybe it's something else. But you'll see that this chapter will definitely speak to the way that you go about your Christianity. It may not be beer and hot dogs at all. But it's going to speak about how you do Christianity and what motivates you to do what you do. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, living a life that is pleasing to you is way more important than anything we can think of. For each one of us, nothing matters more than that. Father, help each one of us to have a heart that is truly soft and open to the teaching from your holy word. Let none of us close off your truth out of stubbornness or pride. And we pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. And now we turn to the celebration of the Lord's table. And do we have the uh, the lapel mic? No, I guess we don't. Okay, well, goodbye. Uh, listen closely. <laughs> We're going to celebrate the Lord's table. And I'm going to try and get that out there to you. We'll get it done. No worries.
Please stand if you are able and join me in singing our final hymn, Hymn 465, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine. now for our benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace, peace in your homes and peace in your hearts. The Bible tells us that we can have all kinds of gifts, all kinds of strengths. We can be bright as can be, but if we don't have love, we're nothing but a bunch of noise. Have your heart open over the next several weeks to be fed wisdom from God's word as to how far that extends into your own life. In Jesus' name, amen.